Welcome to our lecture on agrobiodiversity. I will be honest that this is one of my favorite topics of the course, and I hope that, among other things, you feel a sense of awe for the richness and vibrancy of this awesome pe plant people dynamic after learning more this week. As you've seen in the readings, agrobiodiversity is significant to many domains, among them culture and tradition. I've conducted research in Parque de la Papa, the subject of the Grady reading, and I took this picture while there. This is one of the potato varieties maintained in the Parque, and its name translates to potato that makes the daughter-in-law cry. This is because their tradition is that a woman receives this variety of potato from her mother-in-law upon marriage, and the daughter-in-law is asked is tasked with peeling this potato to serve at her first married lunch, but without compromising its form at all. You can imagine how difficult that would be with such a knobby potato. We'll start today's lecture with the family of the week and then discuss some definitions pertinent to this week's topic. Then we'll talk about the importance of agrobiodiversity threats to agrobiodiversity, and its conservation. I mentioned when we did the tour of key families during the plant classification lecture that we would return to some of them to take a closer look as families of the week. We're doing that here with the Solanaceae, or nightshade family. Remember, the Solanaceae is characterized by five parted flowers with banana anthers and by the presence of alkaloid compounds in their leaves and stems, which have effects ranging from medicinal to hallucinogenic to poisonous. I chose Solanaceae for this week because of the highlight on potato conservation in the readings and because this family very visually displays the concept that crops and their wild relatives are often found at highest levels of diversity in the regions to which they are native. And in these regions, such crops are also deeply culturally significant. So taking a look at some of the nightshades. Chili peppers comprise a few different species and are native to South and Central America Mexico, and the Caribbean. Here you can see a poster created by a few agrobiodiversity conservation organizations highlighting wild and domesticated chili peppers of Mexico. The species of eggplant with which you are likely familiar is Solanum melongina, which is native to South, East, and Southeast Asia, where people cultivate and consume numerous varieties as both food and medicine. Here you can see the wide range of shapes and colors you might find in domesticated and wild eggplants in this region. And potatoes, of course, are native to South America. We eat one species of potato, Solanum tuberosum, here in the United States. But this is not the only domesticated species consumed in the Andes. Here you can see a tiny, teeny tiny glimpse of native Andean potato diversity. Actually, thousands of varieties are grown in that region. Let's start out with a definition of agrobiodiversity. I like this definition by Zimmerer and Van Eck because of its inclusiveness of factors. They write that agrobiodiversity is the biodiversity of food producing organisms and their landscapes and ecosystems, wild counterparts in natural areas, and the realms of knowledge, skills, management, access, and related socioeconomic and cultural factors that are integral to these human environment systems. I made this last part bold to emphasize the interconnectedness and interdependence of humans and environment here. Today's lecture, lecture will center around crop diversity. However, as you'll see, this cannot be separated from any other element included in this definition. 
When we talk about crop diversity, this can be at different scales. One scale is interspecific diversity, or the diversity among crop species. For example, squash and corn and beans. Our major focus today, however, is infraspecific crop diversity, which refers to crop diversity within species. This is also called varietal diversity, with varieties each having their own agricultural and culinary characteristics, as well as their own names, history, and cultural significance. For example, each of these would be considered a variety of potato, as would the potato that makes the daughter-in-law cry, shown on the introduction slide. When, referenced, when referring to non-commercial varieties maintained by farmers and families over many generations, you may notice other terms being used, including folk variety, land race, cultivar, and heirloom. Infraspecific crop diversity is also often related to crop genetic diversity, as crop varieties are often, though not always, genetically distinct from one another. We'll return to why this is important in a moment. To me, infraspecific crop diversity is one of the richest sources of beauty on our planet. And remember, we often find the most varieties of crops within their areas of origin. So for example, we would find many varieties of maize and common beans in Central America and Mexico many varieties of banana in Papua New Guinea, and of eggplants in Southeast and Southeast Asia. Now let's look at why agrobiodiversity is important with an emphasis on crop varietal diversity and crop genetic diversity. First off, agrobiodiversity is essential to agroecological stability with different varieties being more suited to certain environments and climatic conditions, crop diversity allows farmers to farm in a wide range of conditions, both now and in the face of a changing climate. And different varieties may also have different levels of resistance to certain pests and disease, while little to no genetic diversity is associated with vulnerability to pests and diseases as exemplified by the Irish potato famine, in which the late blight pathogen destroyed Ireland's potato crops, which primarily comprised a single variety. Obviously, avoiding something like the Irish potato famine has implications for human health and well-being. But in addition to crop, but in addition, crop varietal diversity may also impact human nutrition due to divergent nutrient profiles among crop varieties. Here is an example from Micronesian banana varieties in which variations in color are associated with an over 8,000 fold difference in beta carotene content. And crop varietal diversity provides aesthetic pleasure and contributes to many people's cultural identities. For example, some families in the Andes plant many varieties of oca, as seen here in this photo of the varietal diversity from one family. In my research, I asked farmers, why do you go through all the trouble of maintaining such diversity? I expected to hear practical responses related to agriculture and nutrition, as we've just discussed. However, by far the most salient responses were, first, because they're beautiful, and second, because it's part of my culture. And also, agrobiodiversity, including crop diversity, but also the genetic diversity of crop wild relatives, as you read about in the Montenegro article, is important for crop breeding and the continued evolution of crops on farms. This is because this genetic diversity underlies traits that will be important for agriculture to meet our agroecological 
and nutritional needs in the future. But despite all of this, agrobiodiversity is threatened. This 2011 figure from National Geographic, entitled Our Dwindling Food Variety, shows the magnitude of crop varietal loss in the U.S. among 10 crop species from 1903 to 1983. Take a moment to read the description and notice the robust selection of seeds that were once available and then gone within less than 100 years. While data on global trends in infraspecific crop diversity are lacking, there are many case study examples of crop variety loss on farms around the world. Here is a table from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, which shows the number of countries reporting genetic erosion for different crop groups. For example, 30 countries reported loss of crop genetic diversity for cereals and grasses, and 18 countries reported loss for vegetables. What, what there are more data on are trends on, inter, on an interspecific scale. The figures I'm about to show are based on research about changes in the diversity of food supplies at national and global levels over the past 50 years. This team of researchers found that first, national food supplies have become more diverse. In other words, we can now eat lots of foods that 50 years ago we might not have had access to. But at the same time, the global food supply has become more homogenous. This means that people around the world are eating more similar diets composed to a large degree of a common suite of global crops with only 30 species providing 95% of the world's calories. And although indirectly, this is related to infraspecific diversity because for many of these global crops, only a handful of varieties are widely cultivated and commercialized. So what are the causes of these trends? The threats to agrobiodiversity are varied, complex, and interrelated, but I'll touch on some major themes. The first is urbanization and abandonment of agriculture. Much of the richness in crop varietal diversity is maintained by smallholder farmers in rural communities. However, as more and more people are moving to cities for education and job opportunities, they are no longer practicing agriculture. And because crops depend on humans to maintain them, crop varieties are dwindling or going extinct as a result. Related to this is that the habitats of crop wild relatives are being overtaken by urban development. The second is the industrialization of agriculture. This includes the interrelated trends of growing more profitable, more profitable or commercial crops, planting commercial seeds, often produced by giant ag companies, and depending on agricultural inputs like fertilizers and pesticides rather than on traditional agricultural methods and natural resistances of crop varieties. The third includes environmental changes, particularly climate change. These are associated with new pests and diseases challenging traditional crops and crop wild relatives going extinct. And the fourth theme is social and cultural change. This includes changes in dietary preferences, stigmatization of traditional foods, and the breakdown of social and cultural structures that support, support traditional crop diversity, like seed exchange networks and rituals that require particular varieties. An example from my research that demonstrates a number of these trends is that Oka farmers near Parque de la Papa 
expressed that the most urgent threat to oka diversity is the oka weevil, which, as you can see on this photo, destroys oka tubers. Changes in climate mean that oka weevils are now present at higher elevations, and they now attack oka earlier in the growing season than ever before. This results in tubers that are not fit for eating and not fit for planting. Because agricultural research is dominated by industrial agriculture, this pest has received little research attention and farmers have not been able to combat it. Furthermore, because their traditional seed exchange networks have broken down over time, they're not able to replenish their seed through these networks. And all of this, combined with similar challenges in other crops, has contributed to the need to seek alternative livelihood options, often requiring farmers and their children to abandon or partially abandon agriculture. So what is being done to conserve agrobiodiversity? As you read this week, conservation strategies are generally grouped into in situ and ex situ methods. Let's start by looking at in situ conservation. In situ conservation is conservation on site. In the case of crops, this means on farms, or in the case of wild relatives, in their natural habitats. When conservation occurs on farms, crops are not conserved in isolation, but rather within the greater human environment traditional agricultural system. In a different podcast interview with Carrie Fowler, he defines extinction of a species to be when that species no longer has the ability to evolve. One of the many reasons that in situ conservation is important is that crops can continuously evolve in response to new selection pressures, and such evolution is often nurtured by traditional farming practices. As you read last week about Mexican campesino agriculture in the Bayon et al. article. There are many other strengths as well as weaknesses of in situ conservation, um, and we will discuss that this week. What I will mention, however, is that one great challenge to in situ conservation is how to support farmers for providing this important service so that they're able to sustainably do so in the future. There are many ideas for how to do this, but one real world example is Peru's initiative to designate agro-biodiversity zones. Pictured here is the first designated zone, a community called Cuyo Cuyo, that farms on traditional Andean terraces, or andenes. On these andenes, the community grows 125 varieties of potato, along with dozens of varieties of other crops. When a community is designated an agro-biodiversity zone, it receives support for agro-tourism, including training and development of, of infrastructure, support for knowledge exchanges among different zones so that they can learn from one another and share seeds, and support to market their produce through brand development. These are ways that communities can generate income because of, rather than despite, their efforts to conserve agrobiodiversity. Another method, method for conserving agrobiodiversity is ex situ or off site. This is conservation off farms and outside of crop wild relatives' natural habitats. And its purpose is to safeguard plant genetic resources in a manner that is safe, organized, efficient, and accessible. This is often done in gene banks, so called because they preserve genetic material. This can be done by preserving seeds, hence the term seed bank, but also by preserving live plants or plant tissue, which may be necessary if the plant does not reproduce by seed. Of course, 
As you heard from Carrie Fowler, the world's biggest seed bank is Svalbard, right here, the green bar. But there are also many other national and regional gene banks around the world. As you can see in this figure, which shows the locations of gene banks with over 10,000 accessions or samples. One challenge associated with ex situ conservation is that plant material is often isolated from other elements of its agroecosystem, including its associated knowledge and cultural significance. As you read for this week, though there are challenges, ex situ and in situ and ex situ conservation strategies can be complementary approaches to agrobiodiversity conservation. I'd like to end with tangible ways that we can support agrobiodiversity. The first is to eat agrobiodiversity. When there is a market for crop diversity, farmers grow it. One place to start is at your local farmer's market. Small-scale farmers tend to grow a wider range of crops and crop varieties than you typically find in a supermarket, and often with local, agricultural, or cultural significance. You might also explore Slow Food's Arc of Taste. Slow Food is an international organization committed to good, clean, and fair food. Their Arc of Taste is a living catalog of delicious and distinctive foods in danger of extinction. I've worked on this project and I find it to be truly celebratory and collaborative. Let's take a moment to watch a video that describes what the Arc of Taste is all about. Like a flood, industrial agriculture, standardization of taste, and an increasingly globalized market are washing away the foods and flavors that communities have shared for centuries and are permanently changing our diet. For example, bananas are one of the oldest and most widely consumed fruits in the world. There are hundreds of varieties, but 96% of those on the international market are Cavendish. A fungus is decimating their cultivation, and according to some experts, these bananas could disappear in just 10 years. The erosion of biodiversity is making our entire system more fragile, but its promotion could provide varieties resistant to this disease. We must do something before it's too late. To save this heritage, Slow Food has built a new arc. The Arc of Taste is a catalog that collects foods from around the world, cultures and flavors that this wave of standardization is wiping away, leaving us all poor and more isolated from our heritage. We can help expand the Arc of Taste by nominating a food to save. We can nominate cultivated crops and livestock breeds, like the Nubia red garlic from Sicily, or the Mangalika curly pig that is disappearing in Eastern Europe. But also wild products, if there is a traditional technique to harvest or transform them, like the case of umbu, which grows in the semi-arid patches of Brazil. And then there are the transformed products, born over centuries to preserve vegetables, milk, and meat. On the Ark, for example, is the pokot ash yogurt from Kenya and yak cheese from Tibet. We can find products among our own memories, history, and personal experiences. Then, by looking through books about food, talking with experts, asking cooks, exploring the plants in a garden, and among the stalls of a farmer's market, even when we are traveling. But information from a book or downloaded from the internet is not enough. We have to see the products, touch them, smell them, and taste them. 
describe the characteristics of the products to save, their textures, tastes, and aromas. And if we don't like the taste? Before rejecting a product for this reason, we should remember that every community has its own preferences. We can also talk about the cultural aspects of these foods to save. Are they cooked for special occasions? Are they found in the memories of the elderly? Do they appear in legends, in songs, or sayings of a territory? All the products of the Ark are artisanal and produced in small quantities. Their quality depends on craftsmanship, know-how, and traditional techniques. We can propose foods that are at risk of being lost to the Ark of Taste. Sometimes, the number of animals of a particular breed is declining, or there may be only a few farmers who know how to grow a certain type of bean. In other cases, a product may still be made by families at home, but it can no longer be found for sale. Hoarding a product on the Ark means transforming it into an element of pride for the community. Everyone can refer to the Ark of Taste catalog and take concrete action. Everyone can look for these products, describe them, eat them, and promote them before it is too late. You can help us too. So I hope you liked that video. Um, you can check out the actual catalog on the link here and see and seek out the products listed to give them a try. The second thing we can do is to grow agrobiodiversity. For those of you with gardens who work in the good food garden, plant heirloom seeds and you can help to keep these varieties alive. There are many great heirloom seed companies like True Love Seeds, of course, which partners with local communities to grow culturally important seeds, like those in the African Diaspora Collection. And the third is to advocate for agrobiodiversity. Vote for representatives who support policies that favor agrobiodiversity and write to your local representatives expressing that you're concerned about these issues. So thanks for taking the time to learn more about this wonderfully, wonderfully rich and fascinating topic with me.